literal divots in the stainless steel where these implosions, explosions, these plasmoid uh, reactions are happening and it is pelting the inside of the stainless steel, creating these craters. Hey hunters, welcome back to Funny Old World. I'm Johanna. It's been a minute since we've done a sort of living room camera setup. Feels a bit weird, but we'll, we'll get back into it. It's all right. So this video is probably one of the most technical videos that I'm ever attempting to do. So bear with me because I have so much to tell you and so much to explain and I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to do it in the most like logical way that I can. So recently I was able to go and get a sneak peek at some new technology that is being developed at the moment and if all things turn out to be true and go the way that it looks like it's going this technology is going to change the world uh, because this technology can literally reduce car emissions and basically like fossil fuel emissions. So we're talking coal burning, cars, trucks, generators, industry machines, and can turn all of the polluting CO2 and carbon monoxide emissions and turn them into oxygen. And personally, what I find the most exciting is that this technology might not be new technology. If anything, it might be the oldest technology to have ever existed. And we are essentially in an era of rediscovering it. So the particular machine that I'm talking about today is called the Thunderstorm Generator. And it is the bit of technology that you can retrofit to your already existing car or engine or generator and reduce the emissions. It is the Thunderstorm Generator. But before we go into the Thunderstorm Generator, and how it works, we all need to be on the same page by a couple of bits of science and a bit of history so we all know what we're looking at. Okay, let's start. About a year ago, you might have seen on Joe Rogan that Randall Carlson, my buddy Randall, uh, went on and he essentially spilled the beans about his knowledge of this technology that was being developed and how excited he was because it uses the print, it's based on the principles of sacred geometry and harmonic numbers and a lot of ancient stuff. Now, Randall couldn't say very much at the time like a year ago because again, this stuff was still heavily in the early days of development and it just wasn't ready, well, it wasn't quite ready to be shown to the world. However, it is now. Also, as a side note, the inventor of this machine, Malcolm Bendel, uh, there is a lot, there is a whirlwind of rumors and misinformation and a lot of gossip that's going around the internet. And for the sake of this video, I wanna just put all of that trash talk aside and I wanna focus on the tech. And then down the line, I'm more than happy to converse with you about the ins and outs of any drama that you think may or may not happen. But for this video, let's just not focus on that. All right, let's just rise above it because you know what I mean? sake of humanity. You might also be aware of the work of Nikola Tesla and the machines that he created and also all of the work that was supposedly lost from Tesla. In the event of his death, a load of his uh, notes and life work were, were confiscated by the government and have still yet to be found, released, it's sort of missing. But what we do have in the images and the history, the re recorded history that we do have, Nikola Tesla's work is definitely very foundational to the thunderstorm generator. So again, so we're all on the same page with how this tech works. First, you've got to know a little bit about plasma and plasmoids, because the whole thing, the whole core of this technology is plasmoid technology. So what is plasma? In case you're starting from the very beginning, like I did, <laughs> what is it? Well, plasma is almost like the fourth element. We've got solid, liquid, and gas. And then if you do something to gas, the next thing that we can get is plasma. Like the sun is made of plasma. And actually most of the universe is made of plasma. Um, they're kind of like blobs of plasma, electrons and ions. Oh God, rolling around in the universe. Now a plasmoid is when a blob of plasma becomes self-contained in its own magnetic field. And it normally takes the shape of kind of like a circular ring, like a donut, which is called a torus. But I prefer to use the word donut because mm, if you think of it like plasma being the workforce and a plasmoid, is like a self-employed plasma because it does its own thing. It's self-contained, it can do, you know, it can go off and 
and do its own job. Are you with me? Fantastic. So the next thing you need to understand before you can get your head around the thunderstorm generator is what is called a fractal toy, a fractal toyrodal moment, which sounds really scary, but actually fractal basically means the shape of something that's like a continuous spiral. You see them all the time in nature in like plants and cactus and snail shells and it's like a swirly spiral that can kind of just go on and 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 on. So we've got fractal, meaning swirly. We've got toro toroidal, which basically means circular, um, and a moment. So we've got a swirly circular moment, <laughs> which does not sound as impressive, but essentially that's what it is. So it's when plasmoids get together and get involved in a swirly circular moment, crazy science stuff can happen. We're talking alchemy, we're talking black holes. Google the phenomenon star in a jar experiment, plasmoids producing light in their reactions. This star in a jar is made when a sound wave is passed through a small bubble inside a flask of liquid. And this sound wave makes the bubble do something remarkable. First it expands, then it collapses. And this collapse happens so violently that vapor molecules trapped inside the bubble slam together and heat up so much that the bubble gives off an incredible burst of heat and light several thousand times a second, giving the appearance of a star. One of the best um, at-home examples of a fractal toroidal moment that you can create is you get a sheet of aluminium, just like normal aluminium that you can get in your cupboard, and you want to cover it with water, H2O, and then you want to put a, um, like a ring light on there, so you've got your light, you've got your water, you've got your aluminium, then you are going to hit that with ultrasound at 43 hertz. Okay, and here's what happens. The ultrasounds, which is going through the water at 43 hertz, create combustion, well, it creates this circular moment, and it literally creates like minute black holes, which rip apart the aluminium. Two holes, which are in the exact shape of the yin and yang symbol, like literally exactly the same shape as yin and yang. And on one side of the, of the hole, you have the matter has literally been eaten. It's been disappeared. You, you've got disappearing matter. And at the other side of the donut hole, on the, on the, the mirror hole, we have matter appearing. It's like it sucks it from one side of the yin yang and deposits it on the other. And it all happens, it's like instantaneous, like a black hole appearing and matter being sucked from one side and blasted out the other, and in that process, it is literally changed, transmuted into other chemicals. For example, we have silver. You, you, you make silver out of aluminium and water and sound waves. Now, not to jump the gun or get too excited, where else have we seen in the ancient world structures and sites where the very important premise about that site is to do with water access, and sound frequency. Somebody say pyramids. If you want to see the full video of the uh, aluminium plasmoid experiment, then go over to the Bob Greenier's YouTube, which is at the Fleischmann Memorial Society. I've forgotten the name of it now, but I'm gonna link it in the description. I'll put it below so you can check out the full analysis of the experiment and do it yourself. So here we have a diagram of what is happening around the space of plasmoids when they are rotating. So we have our donut with our plasmoid moving around and around. We then have the space in between the donut plasmoid is like literally the shape of a lemon. And around the outside, you have almost what looks like an apple where in the similar way that apples pull in at either end of the core, the North Pole and the South Pole. Now at the South Pole of it, you can see a kind of like skirt shape. It's wearing like a kind of angel dress. So at the top of the lemon, it's sucking in the matter. And at the bottom of the lemon, it's shooting out the matter. And you can see a little excrement of matter coming out of this 
diagram. What's crazy is if we zoom in even more, you can see that there are even smaller donuts inside this main ring of donuts. It is literally a spinning wheel within a wheel within a wheel. Where have we heard that before? Was this what the Bible was trying to explain when it recorded Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel within a wheel? Look at the shape of this toroidal movement. What does it look like to you? It is literally the spitting image of the Egyptian Ankh. This one here, this particular Ankh plate, is from the first dynasty, from very, very early on in the dynastic Egypt, literally like 3000 BC. You can see it all through the Coptic Christianity with the Coptic Christian cross. Not only that, you can see it in Thor's hammer. The Viking hammer pendants that we have is literally showing this shape. Take a look at the modern Tesla logo. Again, literally the same dynamic. Now with the right elements and forces coming into play, this toroidal movement is scalable. It can happen at tiny, tiny, tiny micron sizes. It can also happen at a huge scale. Like we're talking whack an aeroplane in the middle of that lemon scale, or even bigger. There is a theory, and I'm not gonna get into it now, about how the plan of the entire Great Pyramid literally fits to scale exactly what you would need for the positions of a toroidal movement inside the Great Pyramid, including exactly where you would pull matter from, from the space and where you would deposit it. And 10 points to the guess where it would be deposited in the Great Pyramid. Yep, you guessed it. It is in fact in the granite box in the King's Chamber. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Here we've got a little clip of Bob Grunier, who is demonstrating on this little machine thing here. When the wheel spins a certain way, which is vertically, uh, you don't move in the center. When you flip the wheel on its side, suddenly a huge amount of power locks into this rotationary pull. I, I'm not even sure what's happening. But this is a really good visual of what is going on. Plasmoids are also responsible for ball lightning. But in a nutshell, ball lightning is a phenomena that has been recorded for all of history. There has been over 2,000 uh, written recordings of it happening and over 200 theories over why it happens. Um, but we haven't fully settled on, on, on the why as of yet. But it happens, there's videos. Um, warning, there are a lot of fake videos about ball lightning but there are some genuine videos about ball lightning. But in history, a lot of historical people have uh, written about it. I think it was, was it Napoleon? It wasn't Napoleon. It was the, the, the Tsar of Russia. He recorded that uh, a ball of lightning literally came into his room and chased him. Um, they've been known to come into churches, it, into build, into hospitals. Um, so it's a ball of lightning, while there's normal lightning, you know, we, it's the streaky Harry Potter lightning. Ball lightning, forms in a different way and is a literal ball of lightning that can move um, and can last for quite a while, um, like a couple of seconds, and it can literally enter through your house. There's been recordings of them coming through, moving through panes of glass or walls, and then like the ball gets back together and just jogs on. Okay, so we know what ball lightning is, we know what plasmoids are, we know what a tor fractal toroidal moment is. We're gonna put all those things together because all those elements are in the thunderstorm generator. Oh, also I should probably say that there is a whole load of like ancient maths that is really, really important to this that I'm not even gonna attempt to explain, but I know a guy who can. His YouTube channel is called Alchemical Science. His name is Jordan and he is one of the most cleverest people I think I've ever seen in the world. And he does a lot of videos explaining all of the sacred geometry the harmonic numbers, the, the sacred maths that are involved in this technology. And he's also been following this technology for a lot longer than I have. So he's got some really in-depth videos about the generator and how they work. So I recommend going to see his video. Okay, so I got to go down to one of the secret locations and I got to go and have a look at the thunderstorm generator uh, with my own eyes. And I got to go and see what I thought. So here's what happened. What's really interesting about the thunderstorm generator is that it is relatively simple tech. It is quite literally a stainless steel pipe tube with a stainless steel uh, welded sphere on the end, which you attach to your exhaust pipe. A 
part of the machine that I like to call the flux capacitor, but it's actually the bubbler. So this is where the water um, gets pushed through. It goes through a sort of stone bit at the bottom and then some metal wool. Basically creates a load of bubbles because you need bubbles for the plasmoids to burst their bubbles to expand and shrink and create the pressures that are needed. We've then got uh, another tube, which inside has a UV light. Apparently you can use the same UV light bulb that you can buy at a pet store for like reptiles. And what that's gonna do is ionize the water and then the water will go into the flux capacitor, i.e. the bubbler. It will be filtered through, uh, it will micronize, which means make teeny weeny 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 tiny little bubbles. So the bubbler makes the plasmoid bubbles and the vortex squishes the bubbles into inverted bagel shapes with a north and south pole, like an apple core. Interesting to note that if you sliced this bagel plasmoid in half, you would get the infinity shape. Say what? Under the pressure, the bubble's outer part bursts, leaving only the tiny center plasmoid. The plasmoids travel up the steel pipe, which is the stainless steel tube, into the vortex and cause the separation of hydrogen and oxygen and then break them down even further into their component parts. Swirly whirly motion, uh, and it will create these toy rodal moments inside the sphere. The sphere really is at the heart of the main thing that's going on with this whole entire contraption. And the plasmoids are pulled into the center of the sphere and the most insane amount of energy is released, like the star in the jar. Now there are other factors such as temperature and magnetic anomalies that I'm still getting my head around. So once I do, I'll be doing update videos to go even deeper into how this thing works. But for now, this is my understanding of it. So how do we know it works? Here we've got some results to look through here. So in this test, which was done on the Honda uh, 380cc engine with petrol, um, you can see the baseline test. So we had the CO2. This was when you run the engine without anything connected. The CO2 level was at 9.8%. The carbon monoxide was at 6.3%. The oxygen was at 1.2%. Very low oxygen there. Then after adding the thunderstorm generator infused with plasmoids, but the bubbler turned off at this point, we had a CO2 level uh, going right down to 1.2, the carbon monoxide was at 0.02, and the oxygen had gone up to 18.8. Pretty amazing. There was a 3.5% increase in efficiency of the fuel. The Honda engine with tip gas, you can see the carbon dioxide was at 3.8, carbon monoxide at 0.12 and the oxygen was at 16.92 ah, i think this was with the with the plasmoids turned off and then when the plasmoids were turned on uh, we could zero out and with the plasmoids turned on it zeroed out the carbon dioxide it zeroed out pretty much the carbon monoxide and the oxygen level went up to 21.37 at best which is around the same as oxygen that you find in the air. So speaking to some people who have been witnessing multiple tests uh, this year, um, they report seeing um, very consistent numbers. Uh, the tests aren't all over the place. They are, they are consistently showing uh, these numbers if you, if you set it up correctly. They are also reporting that you can literally breathe in the exhaust like go right up to it i've had people witness that they've gone up to it and taken a deep breath in the exhaust uh when the thunderstorm generator and everything's all attached um because it's just oxygen like the air we had two testing uh, bits of equipment two bits of equipment that was going to go up the exhaust and was going to analyze what was coming out of the exhaust every test that we did and there was, so there was two independent bits of kit and at the very end they would compare the notes from the from the readings from both and then they would make a graph and like get the the kind of in the middle of it and um one bit of the bit of testing that i was holding on to it was used it's used primarily in motor bike or motor car racing motor car racing and uh, the kit has fraud protection on it for that very reason and it will literally shut off every 10 minutes and have to be reset so you cannot like hack the the machine t to show what you want it to show cool so they had like a fraud protection thing then they had a second independent 
machine thing so there was two of them going on both of them were showing significant reduction in co2 and um production of oxygen but also one of the biggest things which i think that you cannot fake we had a full-on honda machine exhaust a honda engine exhaust running and then we added the thunderstorm generator onto the end and then within a few minutes you couldn't smell you know that everybody knows what car exhaust fumes smells like it stinks petrol stinks and um the smell was uh, not completely gone because it didn't reduce all of it but it was massively reduced it was like oh the smell's gone so i don't know how you would create something that could fabricate uh fake uh readings on two independent machines one with forward protection and also have the physiological experience of literally smelling the exhaust fumes reducing with your own nose which again is something that you can only do if you're in the room but if you trust me scouts honor scouts honor scouts honor <laughs> um i that was what happened to me so interesting one of the previous test spheres the stainless steel spheres had been sawn in half and opened up so that we were able to test and analyze the chemical composition inside the machine to see really what's going on and what these reactions are creating um, on a chemical level. Um, it was incredible. I got to film with a camera that had a sort of times 400 lens, so really, really, really microscopic, and got to have a look at the inside of the stainless steel and what we found was amazing. There are crystals forming inside the thunderstorm generator sphere. Crystal deposits, some of them were absolutely huge. I called them certified long boys. You don't even need a microscopic lens to see them. You can see them just um, shining, dazzling in the sunlight, or if you shine a light onto the inside of the sphere, you can see them with your own eyes. It's like a disco glitter ball in there. But what you can't see with your eyes, uh, and only when you look up close to the lens, is these thousands and thousands and thousands of pockmarks, literal divots in the stainless steel where these implosions, explosions, these plasmoid uh, reactions are happening and it is pelting the inside of the stainless steel, creating these craters. And inside the craters, they are collecting the chemicals and the waste chemicals and these crystals. Now, the chemical analysis we're still waiting on, um, so they're gonna be looked at um, in detail and then it can be categorically to find what the reactional process is inside and what they are creating. Just proof of your eyes, there is definitely something going on um, because anyone who's quite skeptical of the machine says, oh, you're, you know, you're simply just adding water through the exhaust, which is gonna help somewhat, but you can't get these results of zeroing out, zeroing out the carbon and physically something else is going on in there that is not just water going through a pipe. I'm sorry, there's crystals. And again, in certain areas, we can see that the stainless steel um, has turned this amazing deep red gold color, sort of like a purpley red gold. The metal has changed color in certain areas, which made me think of that orichalcum auriculum, you know what I mean, the gold from Atlantis. There potentially could be some serious alchemy at play in here. It is Malcolm's goal to open source this um, for the world so anybody can can try and build or replicate or even expand on this technology and create your own thunderstorm generators, improve it, add to it, simplify it, whatever. It's all open source. So you can you can find it today online if you wanted to, if you happen to have a spare engine lying around and a couple of stainless steel tubes and a light bulb and a bubbler. So what does it mean? What does it mean for the future? So the plan is to open source this, but also get uh, car manufacturers to really take notes of this technology, because if they could include this in, in a car that's already sold to you, then great. If not, for all the millions and millions of existing cars in the world, for all the millions of existing cars in the world that are shooting out horrible gases, um, into our atmosphere, then we can do something about it because we can retrofit your current vehicle for as little as like $1,400, I think, when the parts uh, become manufactured to, to scale and we can, we can mass produce them. Um, we could all be in the next 10 years riding around our cars with these retrofitted emissions. I found out a little bit of information about car emissions that I found very interesting. 
Say you spend $100 to fill up your car with petrol. I assumed that you were getting $100 worth of energy to move your car around, right? The breakdown is actually this. For every $100 that you spend filling up your car, $33 is the amount that actually like moves the car, the, the energy that you will be able to drive your car. You're driving around on $33 worth of car moving ability and $66 of your $100 is going to generate all of the excess energy and the emissions and all of the crap that's going into the atmosphere. Literally two thirds of the money that you pay to put into your car goes into the energy, the waste energy, rather than the energy that we can actually use. And one of the plus points is not only are you reducing your emissions um, and chucking oxygen out into the atmosphere rather than like carbon monoxide, but you are extending the life of your gas, your petrol. So um, in some of the tests that uh, I've, I've seen the recordings of, there's been reports of the gas working at conservatively 40% better, longer. Um, so the longevity of your petrol, your gas, with the thunderstorm generator could be between 40% and 75% longer. 75% is the highest um, recorded claim I've seen and 40% uh, is like the most conservative. So, I mean, either way, you're getting nearly double the bang for your buck. Do you know what I mean? I mean, that is going to, that's going to very quickly pay for itself if you added one of these, retrofitted one of these onto your, onto your cars. Personally, I would like one ASAP. Thank you very much. Petrol's very expensive. The universe is 93 billion light years across. We cannot draw conclusions about universal truths based upon a small percentage of what exists. We cannot be certain any of our physics is universally applicable. So basically, let's not be too up our own bums that we know everything just yet, because just possibly, we might be in for a surprise.